This is a course of lectures and discussions on economics. Here I take up the second view of what economics is about. Not, not about the logic of choice, um, as uh, we discussed last time, but uh, about wealth. And I quote Adam Smith here in his famous book, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, 1776. I apply this to three stories of development. The neoclassical story, told by the heirs of Adam Smith, the structuralist story, and the Marxist story. And what these three stories illustrate is the diversity of views about economic growth. After all, that's the central narrative of economic history. And it's seen from very different points of view. What these narratives try to explain is both why some countries have grown and others have remained poor. One's got to remember also something else, that for most of human history, there was no sustained growth of wealth. Countries remained more or less at the same level. We need to understand what happened in the 17th, 18th centuries when wealth did start to take off. What changes had caused that to happen? There's one other point I think one should remember in Adam Smith's definition, and that is, he says, the nature and causes of wealth. He's using the word nature, and that does raise the question, what is wealth? The questions are going to run through the whole of these sessions because we're always being told that we must increase the rate of growth and increase the growth of GDP. But what is wealth, which is the object of the whole exercise? One way out of the Malthusian trap was obviously to increase the production of wealth so that it could uh, match and even overtake the growth of population. Um, so you know, the trick was to reverse the Malthusian ratios, essentially. Let's get back to what the 18th century economists thought they were after. They correctly surmised that economic growth depends on the widening of the market and the accumulation of stock, in other words, trade and investment. And these were profound insights on which economics still largely lives. First economists understood that with a growing population, people needed to put aside part of what they currently produced to invest in future production. Walt Rostow would later claim from historical evidence that societies need to save at least 10% of their income to take off into self-sustaining growth. If they were too poor to save so much themselves, then they should get the money savings they needed from richer countries. The classical economists also believed that the economic stagnation of pre-modern times was due to the fact that all income surplus to basic needs had been squandered by rulers and landlords. Instead of investing in productive facilities, pre-modern rulers had invested in God, going back to the ancient pyramids and then the cathedrals. They had invested in God. And once God was no longer considered to be the object of economic activity, once you were no longer preparing yourself for the afterlife, then you started thinking about investing in this life. And so the surplus, which there always was a surplus um, of, of, of wealth over basic requirements, because, otherwise, because that surplus supported governments, it supported building programs, it supported a lot of it, it, consumption, uh, extravagant consumption. Once you moved into a different frame of thinking about these things, then the question was, how can you use that surplus productively in order to increase the wealth in this life? And so you got economics starting um, to think in modern terms of accumulation. So profits um, in, in the classical system were the source of, uh, of accumulation. The rate of economic growth thus depended on how much of the surplus from production accrued to the business class. Specifically, economic growth depended on depriving landlords of their rents by um, 
instituting free trade in food, and it depended on keeping wages at subsistence. Since the state wasn't productive but was simply <laughs> wasteful, its claim on resources should be reduced to the minimum compatible with defense and maintaining law and order. The merchants were the frugal people, postponing present satisfaction for future benefits. As late economists would turn it, their time preferences were much better suited to economic growth than the time preferences of monarchs or landlords. So that was the classical position. Now, the neoclassical, when they came to consider the problems, same set of problems, a um, hundred years after Adam Smith, they left out the story of these classes and class differences in contribution to economic growth. And this was because their classical predecessors had won the class war intellectually and in practical terms by limiting the income of the state, the rents of the landlords and the wages of the worker, workers. So the neoclassicals never stopped to consider how fragile this situation was. The triumph of market-based analysis left power invisible, that is, and in particular, the power that was left invisible was the power of the business class, and that, of course, was the entry of Karl Marx's analysis of the classical economic system. But we'll come to that later on. A very important omission from both the classical and neoclassical story um, of growth is the role of the state in economic development. And I've suggested why this should be so. Adam Smith writes, for example, little is requisite to carry a state to the highest degree of opulence from the lowest barbarism, but peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of justice all the rest being brought about by the natural order of things. By the natural order, of course, Smith meant the market system because he thought markets were natural to people. Humans had a natural propensity to truck, barter, and exchange. So it was all from nature that these benefits flowed. And governments um, really interfered with this flow of benefits. <clears throat> And, and one, of the, one of the very interesting consequences of this way of thinking, it's a powerful insight, is that trade provided an alternative principle of order. It was alternative to war, um, so that um, the market system was self-regulating in the sense that it removed the main, uh, main reasons for going to war, because trade was mutually beneficial. That was the classical growth story. You know, the state wasn't there. It was a priori almost. But as a matter of historical fact, most economic growth has been state-led, not market-led, in the sense that a great deal of capital accumulation was done by the state itself, or depended on state subsidy or direction, or depended on frameworks which the state had created, including class frameworks, which it sustained. And this was true of industrialization in, the, in, 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 in Japan in the 19th century and has been true of industrialization in the 20th century, particularly modern the industrialization of Japan uh, and economic growth of, of Japan and China today. The state has taxed the profits of the private owners to create its own investment and welfare funds. Trade, too, was an instrument of state policy. It didn't follow the precepts of the classical economists. And as many historians have pointed out, most countries industrialized under tariff protection or other kinds of protection, not under free trade. I think you can understand the low standing um, of the state in, in the eyes of the classical economist from its previous performance and the fact that it was very corrupt. Even when governments did start accumulating capital uh, for economic purposes, economic theorists were quick to argue that public investment was bound to be less efficient than private investment. And this was because the state couldn't direct capital in line with any consumer other than itself. <laughs> 
So it was bound to be uh, less efficient, even when it did sort of undertake these things. And today, neoclassical economists, and I'm talking really about neoclassical economists here, love to tell stories of how governments invariably pick losers. Um, and so whenever you know, anyone suggests bringing s something into public ownership for the first time or renationalizing, people always say well, the state is bound to lose out, you know, be less efficient at running these things than private enterprise. They ignore the fact that governments have often picked winners. Consider Toyota, the Japanese automobile manufacturer. Starting as a tiny textile manu manufacturer, it was propelled into world rank by acts of government tariffs, exclusion of competitors and subsidies. And I quote Harjun Chang here, had the Japanese government followed the free trade economists back in the early 1960s, there would have been no Lexus. Toyota today would be at best a junior partner to some Western car manufacturer, or worse, have been wiped out. The same would have been true of the entire Japanese economy. You know, you can... Um, uh, tell the same story about Silicon Valley and other dynamic centers of innovation. These are not explained by the state getting out of the way, but actually of subsidizing um, and uh, taking risks um, that uh, your private venture capitalists wouldn't have taken. From the internet to nanotechnology, most of the fundamental technological advances of the past half century were funded by government agencies. That's true in the United States. I and mean, what's so extraordinary in the United States is the rhetoric is totally against government interference. And yet, a great deal of the American economy depends on government, government subsidy, government procurement policies. There's some cognitive dissonance going on, isn't there? The profound disparagement about the role of the state in economic development um, has run through mainstream economics from the start. In every epoch, you find a debate between those, the majority of economists, who believe laissez-faire desirable, with, I quote John Stuart Mill, every departure from it, unless required by a great good, a certain evil, and those who believe that markets need to be embedded in social, moral, legal, institutional structures to keep them free enough to grow wealth, but limit their power. These historical disagreements are reflected in the disagreements by economists today about why some countries grow rich and other countries stay poor. And there's a free trade story about this, um, which is the, the main one. There's a structural story, that's a heterodox story, and of course there's an exploitation story. I mean, the structural and exploitation stories are quite similar to each other. If you look at the arguments for globalization now, they are free trade arguments, essentially. And at the heart of them lies Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage. However rich one country is and however poor another is, there's always a trade which will make both of them better off. And his theory has turned even the most hard-nosed of economists dewy-eyed. Uh, Paul Samuelson calls it beautiful and says that if in any beauty competition in economics, Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage would take the prize. Um, <clears throat> now, it is a very interesting theory. Um, I mean, the fact is that no one's ever followed it. Um, you know, that, that doesn't diminish its, its aesthetic properties. And it's counterintuitive, um, uh, which also adds its, to its attraction to people who want to show that their thinking is more sophisticated than that of common sense. Uh, Adam Smith had recognized that trade arises from natural advantage. And you do see this in all these historical um, trade patterns. I mean, I've been in Egypt. They got la lapis lazuli in ancient Egypt from Afghanistan. They gave, you know, papyrus and things that couldn't be made there um, in exchange. And that's na trade in natural advantages. Inland regions trade with coastal regions. But um, Ricardo explains that trade is not confined to natural advantage. Rational agents understand that their gains will be greatest if they specialize in those activities in which their advantage is greatest. That seems sensible. 
from one point of view, a professor who can both think and type better than anyone else in the town, but who can think better than he or she can type, will hire a secretary to do the typing, leaving himself more time for thinking. I mean, that, seems, that, that does seem to follow. Division of labor does seem in some way correspond to this kind of idea, and then you simply apply it to countries. And you say, you know, Portugal should concentrate on producing wine, uh, leaving cloth production to the English, even though Portugal can produce wine and cloth at a lower cost than England can. So you, you get this sort of extrapolation from what is an observation, you know, in a, in, you know quite local and makes a lot of sense locally, to the whole world. Um, and then you ask, has comparative advantage been the basis of international trade as a matter of fact? And the answer is it hasn't. The free trade theory um, has, of course, been successively refined from where Ricardo left it to bring it closer to reality, but it still ends up prescribing how trade should be conducted rather than explaining how it is. And that is a continuous confusion in economic theory between the normative and the, and the positive. Um, because economic economists have proved arithmetically that free trade makes both partners better off, they expect countries to do this, to trade in this way. And if for some reason they don't, they must be induced or forced to change their bad habits. What seems to be scientifically objective turns out to be very dependent on the facts of power, actually. Your ability to make countries uh, trade in the way um, you think they should for their own benefit. In the 1990s, the growth agenda was taken over by the so-called Washington Consensus. Economists of the IMF and the World Bank induced countries to liberalize their financial markets, reduce trade barriers, privatize public enterprises, cut down on state spending, and allow production decisions to be taken in the global marketplace in return for loans. They were made the condition of loans. And, of course, that was a powerful leverage. And the Washington consensus was the intellectual engine of globalization. Globalization would enable poor countries to exploit their comparative advantage in cheap and abundant labor. If you look at it from the free trade story perspective, development and underdevelopment are successive points on the same road, uh, the road to riches. Some cars overtake others, some break down, but all ultimately um, are headed in the same direction and towards the same destination. Now, um, you turn to another story, which um, is one of the heterodox stories, structuralism. They say this picture is profoundly misleading. Capitalism is a world system, and free trade locks rich and poor countries into their pre-existing um, uh, positions. In other words, it is a static it is a static theory. And the Argentinian economist Raoul Prebisch argued in the 1950s and 1960s that the gains from trade are systematically biased against poor countries. The bias operates through something he called declining terms of trade. The tendency for the terms of trade of primary goods producers to decline against those of the producers of manufactured goods. Such a decline is equivalent to long-term transfers of income from poor to rich countries. Prebish claimed that manufacturing countries have a permanent cost advantage because technical change benefits them more than primary producers. So his, that argument, the Prebish argument, really comes out of uh, 19th century uh, nationalist uh, economics, Alexander Hamilton, Friedrich List. In other words, they emphasized that um, you know, comparative advantage um, is, a la Ricardo, is a static theory. And what you should do is to try and shape your comparative advantages by deliberate state policy and particularly encouragement of uh, what are called infant industries. And so Prebish and his followers in the 1950s and 60s 
demanded all kinds of state intervention in markets to improve developing countries' terms of trade. You know, import substitution was the policy for which uh, uh, they were ma mainly known. This would free developing countries from dependence on imported manufactured goods. So that's a, the structuralist account. And then you have the exploitation theory, which is an extreme version of the structural argument, unequal exchange, um, the exploitation theorists would go. These are Marxists, sometimes called the dependencia theorists. Um, they, they argue that unequal exchange isn't something contingent that can be remedied by changes of policy within um, the world capitalist system because it is a necessary condition of um, capitalist survival that this structure should continue. And therefore, if you really want to um, free countries from unequal exchange, you've got to have a revolution. You've got to withdraw them in some way. From, from, from the system. At the time when these theories um, uh, had a lot of um, traction, the socialist world was, was a counterpoint, was you know, we, we offered an, an alternative model. It's all based on declining rate of profit. As the rate of profit falls in the developed countries, exploitation has to be transferred abroad and intensified. And there are more than echoes here of Mao Zedong's redefinition of the revolutionary struggle in terms of the countryside versus the towns. And a crucial point made by the dependencia theorists, and I, I think, you know, I think there's a lot that's wrong with their, their argument, by the way. I'm just telling it, I'm just saying this is a story, and we have to then decide which of these stories we find more plausible for explanatory purposes as well as for prescriptive purposes. I think one point they do make is that capitalism at the center developed on the basis of the home market, whereas capitalism on the periphery was really imported from outside. Thus, the capitalist economies on the periphery lack any internal capitalist dynamic of their own and capitalism in such conditions leads to an enclave economy, which has no or very few beneficial spillover effects, but kills off the remaining economy um, by di diverting resources to artificial export activities, um, shrinking the tertiary sectors of traditional economies, and encouraging wasteful modern production techniques when they're really inappropriate. And theories of this kind still have um, considerable purchase um, in Latin America in particular. Um, what makes them theoretically dissident in terms of mainstream economics is their um, reliance on a modeling um, of, of the world economy as a binary system, borrowing from Marxian class analysis and replacing capitalist and laborer with center and periphery. That's why development economics um, has never been recognized by the mainstream as a legitimate branch of economics until it was assimilated to the mainstream. And so I think development economics was always regarded as rather inferior, it introduced a lot of extraneous considerations, not, no tight modeling, lots of politics, sociology, and other sort of um, extraneous elements added, and they didn't really feel um, satisfied um, with, uh, with, with the state of development economics until they'd managed to reunify economics as a single uh, uh, set of theorems which applied everywhere to rich and poor countries, that no, no division into binary, no binary divisions of any kind. And, and that was the basis of the Washington Consensus. What was good for the rich was equally good for the poor, and they should all accept that. So we have these three stories of development. The free trade theory shows us different cars on the same road, with some ahead, others behind, and others starting, but assures us that those in the rear will catch up.
by following the recipes of Adam Smith and his followers. The structuralist theory allows some cars to be stuck in the slow lane, but argues that they can move over to the fast lane by following import substitution policies. The exploitation theory argues that capitalism has consigned most peripheral countries permanently to the slow lane from which they can only escape by a revolution against their exploiters. That's the way economics has um, set out this problem, um, that is, set out its inquiry into the causes um, of the growth and retardation of wealth. And I think I've covered the ground very, very broadly, very, very simply. But, but, but I, I would emphasize that mainstream economics only accepts the first story. The others are properly called heterodox which doesn't mean they're wrong, but it just means that um, you don't find them uh, uh, either in the textbooks or, or, or given any, or, or the basis of the theory that the textbooks um, 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 uh, deploy. So is there a, a good uh, point now to um, have a discussion on this? And I mean, you know, obvious questions that occur to me and maybe occur to you is, uh, what do we think of the three diagnoses and prescriptions? Uh, what does the evidence show? Um, has liberalization a la Washington consensus been good or bad for the countries adopting it? In other words, what has been the effects of um, liberalization on poverty rates in poor countries? Uh, has liberalization actually done the job it claims to do, which is lift poor countries out of poverty? What's it done um, uh, to equality? Again, a missing subject in the mainstream is equality, is distribution, because he's not interested in distribution. What do we think about protection and import substitution? Are they always right? Are there valid arguments for protection? Um, is is, is it always just a second best? 